very excited that everyone can make it out this morning. And uh, it's going to start off pretty intense. Uh, so this is going to be, I had uh, physics for physics majors four semesters in a row at 8 a.m. Um, and it's going to be a little bit like that as we start. So buckle up and um, I'll try to keep it light, but it's going to be kind of heavy. So we're going to talk about cash is king. And uh, of course, it's a play on words, right? This is, uh, you know, the, the actual phrase. Um, it's unclear where this came from. Uh, they cited from the late 80s in the world start, stock market uh, uh, downturn. Um, but actually today, we're not going to be talking about cash, and uh, this kind of cash anyway. And we're not going to be talking about this kind of cash or this kind of king. We're going to be talking about this kind of cash, C-H-E. We're going to be talking about this kind of cash. Um, and I think the cash and how we take advantage of the cash and what browsers do with the cash is really important. So I've written about this extensively. And in fact, a couple of months ago, I announced that um, browser cache and what we can do with it and how we can control it and use it to our advantage is the focus of my research um, for the next few months. And I want to start by uh, going over this study that I just released last week um, where I wanted to look at some of the long poles in the tent when it comes to creating fast websites. And I think those are uh, connection speed, how fast your network connection is, how fast you can get those bytes. Uh, down over the wire. Front end, which is primarily JavaScript. CSS also plays a role, but I think JavaScript is a much bigger um, impact on performance. And how we use the cache. Um, so I set up this experiment, and let me describe it really quick. Uh, I'm going to use webpagetest.org. How many people have used webpagetest.org? So this is the most important thing to take away. I should have put this on my takeaway slide. This is the most important thing to take away from today is go to webpagetest.org. And a, uh, you don't have to install anything anywhere. It just gives you a tool that you can use um, to uh, load any URL and get performance information about it. It's done by Pat Meenan, who started it when he was at AOL, but now he's at Google, has a couple resources helping him with it. Um, so I actually have access to a private instance of webpagetest.org, and it supports an API, so I'm able to do uh, large um, runs on it. In fact, at 2 AM this morning, I started a run with 300,000 URLs. Um, but I did this last week, where I looked at the Alexa Top 100. And I ran it in IE9 using a simulated DSL connection, so 1.5 meg down. Uh, 50 millisecond uh, round trip latency. And I'm only looking at the empty cache or first view experience. So this would be the first time, for example, that a user ever came to your website or the first time they came to your website after their cache had been cleared. And we're taking the median of three runs, and the median is based on the window onload. So there's other metrics we should look at for performance besides onload, like start render or above the fold rendering time. But the uh, um, one that's predominantly looked at is window onload. So that's what we're going to be using when we analyze these 1,000 sites. So this is the baseline. And then to look at those long poles in the tent, I did three variations. So the first one was replacing that DSL connection at 1.5 megabits with a FIOS connection that's 20 megabits down, megabits per second. Uh, disabling JavaScript, which would take that long pole uh, out of the tent. And instead of looking at empty cache view, looking at the primed cache view or the repeat view. So let's pause for just a second. I always do this before I run an experiment. Um, I don't know about you guys, but it usually takes me about three to five tries of designing an experiment, running it, looking at the data, and realizing some flaw I had in my design. So before I start an experiment, especially one that's going to take quite a few resources to run, I stop and I envision what the results might say. And I usually have something that I'm expecting it to say. And I always ask myself, what if the results come out the opposite? Would I explain that away by some flaw in the experiment design? And if so, let me address that now. So I stopped before I ran this, and I thought what the results were going to come out to be. 
So of these three, how many people, which of these uh, fixes or improvements do you think is going to produce the fastest result? What about uh, going to a fast network? Uh, disabling JavaScript. And using prime cache. So you guys read the title of the talk today, didn't you? <laughs> I, even though I ran this when I'm on my focus on caching, like I want to focus on caching, but I kind of want to see how big is the thing that I'm focusing on. I actually thought it was going to be JavaScript. So let's just jump to the results. Uh, this is what the results came out to be. So I'm going to kind of focus on the median time, but the 95th percentile time is there as well. So the baseline was about seven and a half seconds. Uh, so that's the median of three runs for each website. So we took the median time, so 1,000 medians. We took the average of that was 7.65. Um, if we disable JavaScript, we're at 4.7 seconds. Uh, going to a fast network was uh, much bigger than I expected, 4.13. And using the prime cache was 3.46. So doing a prime cache, a repeat view, was less than half. It was twice as fast as the empty cache page view. Um, and I don't know, maybe that's surprising, maybe not. But if we look at this next chart, which shows the uh, total transfer size, so this is um, if any of the responses are JavaScript or CSS or HTML, they're compressed. So this is just the number of of uh, bytes transferred over the wire. If we look at the total number of requests and the total transfer size, we can kind of see how these numbers make sense. Um, so the, here's the baseline. Oh, and in blue, I wrote the median on load time, just to remind us. So uh, here's the baseline. Uh, the average transfer size was 900K, and the number of requests was 90. If we disable JavaScript, we go down to 59 requests. Because, of course, uh, JavaScript is doing more and more work in these websites, especially in the top 1,000 websites. They're downloading other dynamic resources. So if we disable JavaScript, the number of requests is going to drop dramatically. Even though there might be some images or whatever in no script tags, it's going to be reduced from what would come down with JavaScript enabled. And so with that drop in requests, we also get a drop in total transfer size. But more importantly to me, something that's not reflected here, is the time it takes to parse and execute JavaScript. So um, we're also skipping all of that pain here as well. I would have thought this would have been much faster. Um, and then this is really interesting and uh, speaks to the pain that we have with building fast mobile sites where with a Fios connection, we're actually downloading as many resources and bytes as we were in the baseline. But because the speed is so much faster, we're getting a much faster time. Uh, again, almost half. Not quite, but almost. And so there's still a lot. This was surprising to me, because a fast network is going to make a huge difference. But there's still a lot of contention in the browser. There's, things have to happen in a certain order in this uh, fast network um, test. We're still executing JavaScript. CSS and reflows are still happening. And yet, just a faster connection is getting us down to four seconds. So um, that's very impressive. And, and I don't know, I, I didn't mention it. The uh, latency here was very low. I think it was four or five milliseconds in the simulated connection. So we're not going to get, we might get speeds that are like DSL on mobile, typically less, but the, they're very high latency. And so that's going to be a problem on mobile networks. But if you have a fast home network, um, you might be getting faster uh, page load times, benefiting from that. But this is the big change, is with a prime cache, we're dropping down to about 160K and about 30 uh, from 90 requests to only 30 requests. So um, now this is a best case scenario. So typically the way, so what happens in web page test is you say, load the page with an empty cache, and then load it again and record the results for the prime cache, for the um, repeat view. And that repeat view happens 30 seconds after the first one. So whatever was stuffed into the cache is still there, right? There's, the user didn't wander off for a day or two downloading other images and videos and websites. So this is a best case scenario. Anything 
that the website owner said could be cached is going to be there in the cache. Whereas typically you would want to think about a repeat experience happening the next day or three days later, whatever your typical user demographics, user sessions uh, uh, stats indicate. So this is a best case scenario, but um, it produces very significant savings. So you know, this tells me the cache is pretty important. So before I go too much farther, we're going to get into the uh, physics for physics majors part of the talk. And we're going to do a little primer, a little review on how caching works with HTTP. How many people feel comfortable with their knowledge in caching? It's only four slides, so, so bear with me. OK, so suppose we're requesting main.js. We're going to send up a simple git request like this. The nice thing about uh, HTTP is it's um, a text-based protocol, so we can see everything. Um, and we're going to get back this response that says it's a 200 OK. Uh, we're, we're returning some text JavaScript. And it's about 200 K of JavaScript. Um, and there's the actual beginning of the file. So that's pretty simple. That's how a simple Git works. Now, the next time the user goes to this page, in a minute, in a day, this is typically what's going to happen. They're going to make another Git request. And they're going to get a, the same response, right? There might be some heuristic caching going on, and we'll talk about that in a few slides. But basically, this is the way it's going to work. And what we notice is we just downloaded 200K twice. And it's probably the exact same 200K. It's the exact same size. And that's not really efficient, right? So the guys who created HTTP said, well, what can we do to make it so that if a file hasn't changed, you don't have to download it again? And the way uh, that's achieved is with a conditional get request. So the first time you make the request, the thing that changes is in the response, the website owner has added these two response HTTP headers. Uh, and you don't have to add both. You could add one or the other. Um, last modified gives the date that this response was last modified. So the last time the developer edited it and pushed it to production was September 24th. And there might also be an E tag. This could be anything you want. By default, Apache puts in the file timestamp, which is just kind of repetitive with the last modified. You might put a checksum or something like that. It could be something that is generated based on something about this user and their location and their browser. Um, but whatever it is, it can be any string that you want. Uh, according to the spec. Now, and then we get 200K of JavaScript. Now, the next time, the next day, the user asks for this resource, the browser knows that it got these headers, the e tag and the last modified, before. And so the browser can send up these two new request headers, if modified since. I want this file, main.js. I have one in my cache that is dated September 24th. Do you have anything that's been modified since then? And also the e tag. I, it also has this e tag. Is the new one got a matching? Does the new one have a matching e tag? And if nothing has changed, the server can just return this tiny little 304 response code. So we can save 200K. So that's awesome. But if you're on a high latency network like mobile, making this check, doing this conditional Git request for all your resources is going to be very painful. You'll have tremendous savings, but the typical website has about 80 or 90 requests in it. So if you had to make 80 of these conditional Git requests over a mobile network, or even desktop, it's going to slow things down significantly. So the guys thought, what can we do? Is there a way to avoid doing this conditional Git re uh, request every time? And that's where we get into the caching headers that indicate um, how long something can be held in the cache and reuse before it expires. So the way that that's enacted is the website owner returns this max age, cash control max age value. And this says, this is the maximum number of seconds that you can continue to repeatedly use this response, this JavaScript file, without even checking with me. You don't even have to bother to check. And so in this case, this is one year of seconds. So within a year, if the user loads this page again and needs this file, there's no request, no HTTP traffic at all. It just reads it from the cache off local storage, off disk. So that's really, really fast. It eliminates the HTTP traffic altogether. Now, this is what is really, really good. 
And if your resources aren't changing, or you know when they change, you can just change the file name, you want to use a max age. A year is good. A week is about the minimum you want to use. You can use 10 years. Really, once you push something out live to the world, you never want to change it without changing the name, because there are so many misconfigured proxies out there. About 1 to 10%, somewhere in there, of your users will never get an update unless you change the name. So really, you can make it cacheable for 10 years. It doesn't matter. You're never going to push a change without changing the name of the file. Um, so a year is kind of good. Um, but in some cases, you have something dynamic, like the inbox, the address book, uh, the number of mentions, things that you don't ever want the browser to cache or any intermediate proxies to cache. So how do you avoid caching, even though that's the opposite of what I want to espouse? I'll just mention it for clarity. Um, suppose you had something like inbox.js, maybe it's JSON or something. Um, you can return this cache control header and set a max age of zero and specify no cache and must revalidate. That tells the browser, any time a web page wants this resource, you have to check back with me. And if it's something that's confidential, you might also want to add no store. Like banking information, you could add no store. Um, so the next time that uh, the user loads a page that needs inbox.js, it makes the request again. So that's how caching works. That wasn't too bad. But the takeaway from this is it's really important to be explicit. You really should never kind of be in the waffle. Say, well, I'm not sure if I don't want it cached or I do want it cached. I just won't do anything, and I'll leave it up to the whims of uh, intermediate caches and proxies out there. Um, what to do with this resource when the user requests it next time. Be decisive. If, if something isn't changing very much, or if you can change the file name whenever it does change, then make it cacheable for a year. If something shouldn't be cache, if they should check back with you, your server, every time, then say you got to say no cache. Otherwise, it, they might not check back. So be explicit. Specify cache control, uh, no cache, or max age. So that's a good takeaway. What do we actually see in practice? This is where it gets a little more fun. So I think the, the phys physics for physics majors part is more or less over. Because um, it's always fun to look at what real websites are doing. And that's what we're going to go into now. So here's the Alexa Top 1000 worldwide. And what we see is, uh, I'm just looking at max age here. So we see that, uh, I can't even read this. It's too small for me. 5% uh, have a max age that's more than a year. That's really good, not as good as it should be. On the other end, 37% of responses don't specify any max age, right? So some of these might be no caches, right? There's no max age. You should say max age zero. You don't have to. But some of these might be a no cache. But 37% is pretty high. And the top 1,000 sites are better configured than um, the long tail of websites out there. So we can look, and uh, I looked at this data, and I saw that 14% of the responses had no cache or must revalidate. And about 10% of that 14% were in this bucket with no max age. So that means, uh, and also in here, 24% uh, of them had no cache control header at all. So that's where people have just said, I don't know about this, or I'm, I'm just ambiguous. I don't know what the answer is. And 27%, 37 minus 10, have no max age. And they don't say no cache or must revalidate. So again, the website owner is just being ambiguous and ambivalent about what the caching behavior should be. And what that means is these responses are going to be subject to heuristic caching which we'll talk about in a minute. So that's not great. The top 1,000 sites in the world, 25% of the responses really have no indication of what caches should do with them. Should I reuse it? Should I not reuse it? I don't know. You guys just decide. And really, as top websites, people shouldn't do that. Now, if we look at the top 300,000, all this data I'll mention at the end is from this project I run, httparchive.org. Um, and currently, as I mentioned right now, we kicked off the crawl. We're doing 300, analyzing 300,000, uh, the top 300,000 worldwide URLs every two weeks. So if we look at the top 300,000, again, as we get out of that top 1,000 uh, well-configured sites, 
things get a lot worse. So instead of 37% having no max age, now it's 57%. More than half of the resources have no max age indicator. Again, there might be some, they don't have a max age indicator because they're not cacheable, but only 9% of this 57% are no cash. So that means 44% have no cash control header at all, and 57 minus 9 is 48% have no max age or no cash or must revalidate. And so they're subject, half of the responses are subject to heuristic caching. Whatever behavior the caches out there in the world want to do, and there's no spec that dictates how heuristic caching should work. So 50% of the responses are going to be cached up to the whims of whatever cache the user is behind their local cache or their intermediate caches. And the other sad thing is, as much as I love to go out and talk to people and beat the drum around high performance, we're really not seeing a pickup in the use of caching headers. This is for the last two years, um, looking at the uh, top. Two years ago, we were only doing 50, 000, the top 50,000 URLs. So during the course of this, that's what some of the drops and, and increases are from. Is as we expand the number of URLs we're looking at, the stats drop a little bit, because generally, as you get closer to the tail, performance is worse. So we'll drop a little bit, and we'll start climbing, drop a little bit. But generally, there's not a great uptake in this very important performance uh, optimization of getting resources to be cached. So we have slow adoption. So a lot of these resources, in the case of the top 300,000 URLs, are going to be subject to heuristic caching. And there's nothing that dictates what an intermediate cache or local cache should do for heuristic caching, but there are guidelines. So this is what the spec says. In the absence of max age, so that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about resources that don't have a max age, and they also don't have no cash or must revalidate. So really, the website owner hasn't said anything about how caching should uh, be dictated for these resources. In the absence of max age, the cash may compute, it's up to them, a freshness lifetime using a heuristic. If the response has a last modified time, the heuristic expiration value should, you don't have to, but we recommend you should, be no more than some fraction of the interval since that time. So it's actually very simple, but the wording makes it a little hard for me. So suppose today, October 15th, we downloaded main.js, main and it had its last modified time of September 24th. How long ago was that? 21 days. The guideline is you should have a freshness window of two days, 10% of that, two days. So if the user came back tomorrow, if they downloaded it today, and we uh, saw that it last modified the 24th, the user came tomorrow, and there was no caching headers, the browser would say, well, it's been less than two days, so I'll let you reuse it. I won't generate another request. If they came back. Uh, two days later or three or more, then the browser would re-request it, even though it's possible and likely that this resource hasn't changed. So that's how heuristic caching works. Now remember, we've got browsers and intermediate caches don't have to do this if they don't want to. Um, and we've got 50% for the top 300,000 sites are subject to this you know, fairly vague guideline about what uh, caches should do. So let's assume, it turns out IE9 uh, actually adopted this exact behavior. Um, and that's what we ran our experiment in. So what's a typical interval between ran when we ran the experiment? I ran it uh, the first week of October. So when I ran the experiment and the last modified date of the resources, what's a typical interval of that time, the date the experiment ran and the last modified date? So if we look at these top 300,000 responses, uh, websites, if we look at all the responses, there's about uh, 3 million of them. No, 30 million of them. Um, this is the distribution. About 3% have an interval. So that's the delta of the time of the experiment and the last modified date. 3% have an interval under a day, another about 3% under a week. Um, so we have about. 6% of them have a heuristic max age, 
that's the interval, that's less than a day, which if you take 10% of it is like two hours. So if the user, if, there's, if you don't specify anything, the user comes back within two, yeah, two hours. Um, and this is out of the total number of requests. So we had uh, about 40, what was it, 48% of the responses didn't have any max age headers. 6% of those will ha be able to be reused in uh, two hours or less. But, um, so that's not very good. And we have about, of that 48%, 30% of them, so about a third of overall requests will be able to be reused without a response um, if it's uh, done in more than three days. So that's not bad if all the browsers out there have adopted this heuristic. Um, but it could be a lot better if they just specified a max age, right? It's not that hard. And you're going to get some caching behavior anyway. It's just that you don't know what it's going to be. It's up to the whim of the caches, whatever they've implemented. So it would be much better, since you're going to get some caching behavior anyway, to be very explicit about it. If you want your stuff cached, specify how long it should be cached and when the browser should check back for an update. If you don't want it cached, specify a no cache. And then we also have this 8% uh, of the overall responses are unknown. In the case of IE9, I don't know about other browsers, what it does with the unknown ones is it will check once per session. So the, you close your browser, you open it the next day, you visit that website that has something that was cached without any max age and without last modified, then um, for those, the browser's going to check the first time and never check it, or IE9 will check the first time and never check again for the life of that session. So again, you're getting behavior that you don't really know about. So a lot of stats, a lot of charts. Let's do something a little more fun. Let's bring it home a little bit. So people who live in glass houses shouldn't throw stones, but it's kind of fun. Nobody's perfect, so please, everyone, take this with a grain of salt if I talk about a website that you work on. So, for example, if you're a speaker at this conference, your slide, a slide for your website is probably in this deck. So I sat down to do this last night, and I was excited. I analyzed a lot of websites, and I looked at the speakers and the websites they worked on, and a lot of these, like Airbnb, were interesting sites that I had never analyzed from a performance perspective before. And I, my, I was you know, excited. This is going to be fun. I'll put people on the you know, uh, hot seat a little bit. I'll tell, tell attendees to go, and why are you making your site better configured? And it was hugely disappointing, because most all the sites were really good. I, all the speakers who run these websites, thank you very much. But uh, you kind of took the wind out of the sails of my presentation. So here we have Airbnb, 81%. So uh, I color code the, the stats. Green is good, red is bad. Uh, an ugly harvest color is in the middle. So all green. 81% uh, of the responses have cache control headers. Uh, sure, it could be higher, but that's pretty good. Um, a very small number of them uh, have very short. Uh, so you might specify a cache control header, but it might be really short. Like, oh, only cache it for six minutes. That's bogus. Well, only 10% of the resources have an expiration time less than a day. So that's pretty good. That's really good, in fact. Um, and they've specified last modified. You want to specify last modified. Otherwise, heuristic caching is really um, out the window as well. And browsers are getting smarter and smarter and smarter. Um, I didn't have time to um, reverse engineer the heuristic caching for all the browsers, but I'm confident that they're uh, good and they're going to be getting better. So, um, but you have to specify a last modified to give those, heurist those browsers, those caches, some clue about what they should be doing heuristically. And 78% is pretty high. And uh, the last modified interval is about 40 days. So in cases where a heuristic cache has to kick in, it's going to be about a four-day uh, interval, at least in IE9, 10% of 40 days. So that's pretty good. Airbnb is in pretty good shape. Very good shape, I would say. Another site I hadn't looked at, Pinterest. 
really hoping for a lot of red here, not getting it. Um, so here we see, here we see 131 requests. 87% of them have a cash control header. Only 2% expire in less than a day. 94% have last modified, and the median uh, last modified interval is 151 days, so 10% of that would be a heuristic window of 15 days that something could be reused in the cache if it didn't have a max age. So this is, again, really good. So I've got about 10 or 15 other speaker websites that all look good, and I'm not going to go through those because that's not fun. So let's look at some that aren't so good. Uh, so I think this, uh, this is Sydney is speaking today, and he's from StackMob. Only 25% of the responses have a cache control header. Sydney, do you want to raise your hand? No? <laughs> I haven't met him before. I hope he's not bigger than me. So uh, only 25% of the responses have a cache control header. And again, like this is like not being decisive. It's like making a decision by doing nothing. And that's not good. Like, be explicit. Should these things be cached or not? Because you're going to get, in certain browsers, you're going to get certain caching anyway. Do you really want to have no idea, no control over what's happening? Or do you want to control what your resources are going to get updated? So 25%, that's really bad. Um, the ones that do have caching headers, only 1% expire in less than a day, so that's good. And 81% of the responses have a last modified. That's really good. And it's a really long last modified interval. The median last modified time between when I ran the experiment and the uh, median last modified date is 240 days. But that's a red because that means the resources aren't changing very much. And they could have made them cacheable for a really long time, but they didn't specify any cache control header. So they could have made these things cacheable for uh, months, maybe even a year and they're not uh, achieving that. So it's a really lost opportunity. Mozilla, generally really good. Um, and this is a small page, only 32 requests. But it's their front page. Only 31% have a cache control header. Again, like, be explicit. Uh, not too many have a short expiration time. Most of them have a last modified. The median uh, last modified time is 24 days. 10% of that is only 2.4, so that's not a great heuristic window. If, they are, if the median uh, time between when they change is 24 days, you could specify a, last, a max age of a week or two and get better caching. Zendesk is speaking today. Makito. Uh, 70 requests, so you know it's kind of in there. It's a median you know, average page. 94% have cache control, that's really good but 59% of them expire in less than a day. Like, I find it hard to believe that they're changing so much. And in fact, if we skip down, all, unfortunately only 69% of them have a last modified, but they have a pretty long last modified interval. And so it really seems, again, that this is a last, lost opportunity. Things aren't changing that much in reality. When we look at the last modified of the resources on this page, specify a max age header um, for more of them. Catch.com, 52 requests on a very heavy page. Only 19% have a cache control header, and a lot of them expire in less than a day. Only 69% have a last modified, so we really don't even know what the, we're not giving a lot of clues to the heuristic, uh, heuristic uh, uh, algorithms. And again, there's a lot of opportunity. Uh, resources aren't changing that much. We could have specified a max age here. And Intel, I think is the last speaker site I'm looking at, 90 uh, resources. Um, only 66% have a cache control header. 84% of them that specify a max age expire in less than a day. Um, a large percentage of the resources have last modified. But there's a, it seems like there is a lot of churn in the resources in this website. So they should be more explicit about what's cacheable and what's not. Certainly, you're not going to get a large heuristic uh, interval here. 10% of 12 is only one day. But it, uh, if they're changing it on average every 12 days, you could have specified a max age of about a week. So these speaker sites, thankfully, weren't that bad. Um, and that's 
what we see, we saw that before in the charts I showed the histogram with the use of MaxH, we saw that, we saw that um, when we looked at the top 1,000, they had better use of MaxH than the top 300,000. Um, so that's typically what we see. So I'm not surprised that speakers from companies, you know, that are, uh, you know, speaking here at a dev conference, that their sites are better configured. But we still saw these pretty bad statistics out there for the long tail of sites. Um, so where do these bad apples come from? Um, if you do any consulting work in the area of performance, I recommend that you look at media companies. So we're going to do that really quick, and we'll see that things are worse out there than um, is reflected in the speaker websites. So here's uh, Boston.com. 69% uh, have cash control. A lot of the resources expire quickly. Um, there's a fairly decent last modified interval, so um, we could have uh, had a higher last modified rate and more max age. Time.com. Uh, hardly anything has a cash control header. Things that do expire very quickly. Uh, there's not a lot of churn in the resources, so specifying a max age would have been an easy win. USA Today, a large site, 127 requests. Almost nothing has a max age. A lot of quick expiring um, and a fairly decent last modified uh, interval, so they could have taken advantage of max age. Telegraph. A large site, 179 requests, almost nothing has a max age. The ones that do expire very quickly. Um, and again, a huge opportunity to make things cacheable. Uh, TMZ.com, huge number of requests. That's got to be wrong. There must be, well, maybe not. Uh, and it's all red. Uh, only half the things have a max age. Uh, the ones that do expire very quickly, only 60% have a last modified. And the last modified time is pretty short, so the heuristics aren't going to be that good. So the takeaway here is be explicit. So I spent a lot of time last night and this morning looking at these background, ser searching Flickr for these background photos. And searching for the word explicit didn't return what I expected. <laughs> so I had to change my search terms. Uh, but you want to be explicit. Always specify a cache control header. If things can be cacheable, specify a max age. If you want to be a little conservative, be a little conservative. But specify something, because most caches are going to do some level of heuristic caching. If you don't specify anything, it's taken out of your hands. So you're still going to be stung by stuff being stuck in the cache. You just won't have any idea how long that's going to happen and when the user is going to get an update. So if things can be cacheable, specify a max age. If you don't want them to be cacheable, specify no cache. Does that all make sense? OK, so that's a very easy takeaway for today. Um, I wanted to touch on some other things that are kind of outside our control, or outside at least of this cache control header. This is a study that Tenny Toyer and I ran at Yahoo uh, in 2007. So it's been a while, but it was a seminal study that still gets a lot of links to it, where we found that we ran this on various Yahoo sites. And we found that about 20% of, I heard crickets. About 20% of sites um, of page views, the user has an empty cache. We measured the user, by empty cache, what we mean is the Yahoo resources that had a 10-year expiration window were not in the user's cache. And we were able to measure that by putting a, um, a transparent image in the page that had long caching headers and detecting whether that was requested or not and correlating it back to page views. So we found that about 20% of page views were done where the user did not have Yahoo resources in their cache. And that's not too bad. That's maybe what we would have expected. But when we translate that into unique users, it turns out that of our daily users, about half of them came in at least once a day without Yahoo's resources in their cache. How could that be? And why are these so different? Well, the answer is the, the uh, usage patterns of a site. If the typical number of page views per session is five, the user will come in the first time and have an empty cache. But then for their next four page views, they'll have a prime cache. So they would only register once when we look at it from the unique user perspective. So even though 
the number of page views, the percentage is fairly low for an empty cache, users really anchor on a negative experience. And so when that first time they come in, if they have an empty cache, or at least if your resources aren't in their cache, they're going to have a slow page load time, and that's going to give them a negative perception of your brand and your website. So it's really unusual. When we, when we have our, the repeat patterns were very high. We had a 10-year expiration window. Why is it that so many of users coming back still did not have our resources in their cache? We don't know the exact answer. There are some things, um, certainly, that we can think of. This was a great, Will Chan works at Google on Chrome, and he wrote this about six months ago uh, about caching. He started looking at some of the stats. And he found out that uh, approximately 70% of users do not have a full cache. So take the inverse of that. It means about 30% of users using Chrome have a full cache. The cache size varies between about 150 and 320 megabytes, depending on your free disk space. For those users who filled up their cache, it only took uh, four hours for them, for the median user, to fill their cache. Only four hours of active browsing. That's pretty fast. Um, and then this thing about where the cache gets cleared. About 7%, he found, of users explicitly clear their cache through Chrome settings, which was maybe higher than I expected. But this was a real surprise, I think, to him as well and the Chrome team. 19% of users once a week experience some cache corruption that required clearing their cache. So once a week, over 25% of users were having their cache cleared, at least once a week. So I think that's one thing that's attributing to people visiting our sites and not having things in the cache that we would have expected to be there. Here's another thing is cache sizes. This is a study from blaze.io, which is now part of Akamai, talking, looking at mobile caches, which are uh, uh, certainly much smaller than desktop browsers. But even desktop browsers, with the amount of um, browsing that you do in them, will fill up fairly quickly. So caches are small. So website uh, developers, web developers, are looking at alternatives. One is app cache. Uh, it helps with offline as well as uh, having a longer cache. Um, the nice thing about app cache, and I'll talk about local storage, is you get cache that's dedicated to your website, a certain amount of space. Five meg uh, might be a typical amount to think of. Whereas the browser cache is shared with all the other websites. So it's possible, so your resources are in contention for that space with all the other websites that the user visits. Um, so here's how it works. You specify a manifest attribute, which gives the file name for your manifest file. That file has to start with a cache manifest header at the top. We'll talk about the comment in a minute. Um, and you have these various sections. Cache is what can be saved in app cache. Network are things that should never be saved in app cache. You should always pull them from the network. Fallback helps you in that offline mode. If you're online, hit index.html. If you're offline, if you don't have network access, fall back to this other uh, website. Oh, something, I see people taking notes. Something I should have mentioned, the slides are already up on my website, stevesouders.com, and also on SlideShare under my account, which I think is Souders. Um, and you have to, at least for now, return a specific content type for all this to work. So it's not too difficult, but it turns out when you actually try to get it working, it is really difficult. There are a lot of gotchas. Um, even if you don't list the HTML document in that network section, any HTML document that uses the manifest attribute is automatically saved into app cache. So if you have something like a login form on the page, but the user has logged in, even though they have a valid cookie, they'll be reading that out of the uh, cache, and it will still have the login form in it. So you have to rethink the flow of your website, which can be very challenging. If anything in the cache 404s, nothing is cached. You have about 5 meg. Um, that comment in there is, uh, that I talked about in the manifest file, if you change a resource, so suppose you have an image that's referenced in the manifest file, and you update that image on the, your website, the uh, app cache will never be updated unless you actually modify the manifest file. Because the first thing the browser does is it checks to see if the manifest file has changed. If it hasn't changed, it doesn't check any of the resources, just to be efficient. If you're on a, a phone, for example, you don't want it doing a conditional get request on all of the uh, manifest file resources. So the way that it um, controls whether it does that check is by first checking the manifest file itself. And what this uh, 
means is that it's going to take two reloads for a user to get an updated resource. Now that's kind of confusing and it tripped me up when I built my first app cache app. So let's walk through an example here. So suppose you go home, you, uh, this afternoon you build a app cache app, you push it, uh, and it has this green logo GIF, right? And some user loads your app, um, and uh, when they load it, the app cache is empty, so the browser reads everything um, off the network, it gets the manifest file, it goes through the manifest file, it sees logo.gif listed, it downloads this green logo and saves it to app cache, and then renders the app to the user. So then you go home tonight, uh, the next night, tomorrow night, and you decide to change the logo to be orange, and you push that to your server. So now you've got a new logo up there, and you even remember to modify the manifest file somehow. So now the next day, the user loads the app again. But what's the browser do? The whole point of app cache is to not touch the network, to touch the network as little as possible. So what the browser does is it loads that HTML document out of app cache. That HTML document references logo.gif. The browser looks and says, oh, I have logo.gif in the app cache. So I'm going to, and the one that's in there is the one that I last stored there is green. So I'm going to use that one. And that's what the user sees. It sees this green one that's pulled from the app cache. Even though the night before you updated that logo, the user is still going to get the one out of app cache. But now what happens is the browser checks to see if the manifest file has changed. It has. So it checks all of the images, and it sees that there's a new logo. And so it gets the orange logo, and it saves it to cache. But the user is already looking at the green logo. And so it's not going to be until the next time the user loads the app that this is all repeated, and the browser says, oh, here's the HTML document. It references logo.gif. I have that in my app cache. Let me pull it out of app cache and render it for the user, and the user sees your update. So that's why it takes two reloads for a user to see any updated resources. So you can get around that by tracking this update ready event. Um, but it's more work that you have to do, and you have to figure out what you're going to do in that case. If it's something like the logo changed, and they're the exact same size and won't uh, cause the page to flash, you could just swap it out. If it's um, like a JavaScript update or a CSF update that's not that critical, or an image update, maybe you do nothing. If it's like a security JavaScript fix, you might tell the user, um, we've updated your, ver your local version of our JavaScript, and we're going to reload the app so that you get this security fix. So you can decide what to do here, but you have to do the heavy lifting. Local storage is really easy. It's got a simple API. Uh, again, it's about 5 meg. Um, one warning is that, that we've gotten from some browser vendors is it can be bad for performance because it's synchronous. Um, but recently, Will Chan, the same guy, ran this study where he found that even for the 95th percentile, it's only like 50 to 150 millisecond impact on load time. So uh, I think local storage, depending on how you're using it, um, could uh, be fine and not have a large impact on performance. And we're seeing folks like Google Search on mobile and Bing on mobile use it to store JavaScript and CSS. I'm running out of time, so I'm going to go over this pretty quickly. Um, what they do the first time you load it is they download a bunch of inline JavaScript and CSS. They save that to local storage, and they set a cookie for each string or module that's saved. The next time you get a search result, the server looks at the cookies and doesn't have to download that inline code again. And this reduces the size of the page from 110K to about 10K. The one tricky thing is what they're doing is they're reading these strings out of local storage and evaling it. And so if you have um, other third-party JavaScript on the page, they also have access to local storage, equal access to local storage. So if you're going to use this technique, you'll want to wrap it around some sort of uh, cryptography checksum uh, algorithm. And there's a URL for a discussion on that topic. Um, and the other thing, so that's something else that's, uh, uh, that people can work on are other forms of web storage. But the other thing that I think we're going to see happen is smarter browsers. Um, we're seeing tremendous improvement in browser performance. Bigger caches, uh, smarter purging, I think, is co coming. IE10, I think, was the first browser to take MIME type in consideration. I'd rather have you purge images than purge JavaScript, because JavaScript is more important um, to download quickly. Uh, and prioritizing websites. Here's an example of what I mean by that. Um, 
in IE 9 or 10, I forget where, they added this feature for preserve uh, favorites website data. So anything that's in your favorites or bookmarks, when you clear your cache, you can say, yeah, but those are my favorites, don't clear it. Now, I don't necessarily like the UI here. I have thousands of bookmarked websites. They're not all my favorites. I'd rather have it the browser learn my favorites. It, it already knows the top 10 sites I visit all the time. Those are in the start uh, page, right? So automatically give those preferred caching. And I think we're going to see this. Oh, here's another example in Chrome where there's a lot of uh, DNS resolution and TCP connection pre-connects that are done depending on what you've done in the past. For example, it knows your top 10 most visited sites. When you start Chrome, it resolves those 10 domain names automatically so that they're ready to go. And other uh, uh, pre-connect behavior like that. And I think that's where we're going. No one knows um, how you use the web better than your browser. It knows what you've done in the past. It knows the context that you're in now. And I think we're going to see things like we saw in Chrome with DNS and TCP pre-connect. And we're going to see that move into the world of prefetching resources as well. I know, for me, every morning I sit down and I load, I have a script that loads 30 websites, and then I go get my coffee and I come back, to because I hate watching websites take a long time to load. Um, and the browser will know, in the future, the browser will know that behavior, and it will know at that time in the morning, Monday through Friday, it should start pre-connecting and pre-fetching resources that were on those websites yesterday that had a long cache time make sure that they're in my cache, and maybe even start reading them into memory, doing some JIT on them. So uh, I think we still have a, long, uh, uh, a large number of optimizations for performance that we're going to get from browsers. So the takeaways, that was actually pretty good. This is a brand new talk. Uh, I timed it pretty well. Get the uh, need cache. So takeaways. Uh, Gather some stats, like um, if you read that blog post on the study Tenny and I did at Yahoo, it explains how we did it with the transparent pixel. Run it on your site. How many of your, your users are benefiting from cache or aren't? Be explicit about how, what your caching policy is for every resource. Consider augmenting uh, what you're caching, your caching uh, performance, by looking at local storage and app cache. And lobby browser vendors to implement smarter algorithms, bigger caches, and more personalized caching for the user. I just wanted to mention, uh, I got almost all the data for those charts and stuff are off the HTTP archive, which is a uh, part of the Internet Archive project. Um, it's a project I'm running, so check that out. And that's it. Thank you very much.